Hello, hi, NFL fans. This is Jeff Reinbold. We're back for another episode of the Jeff Reinbold Show. I'm joined, as always, by my buddy, Michael McQuaid. He is he's known as Michael at NFL, and he is the, the uh, supervisor and number one lead dog in the for the Pittsburgh Steelers podcast in Ireland. Michael, when will we have the first Steelers podcast in Ireland? I, you're you're not going to let me live this down, are you? It's um, <laughs> it's it, it's out now. Irish Steelers podcast, which fitting in, and thank you very much, Jeff. It, it's a fitting introduction to our NFC West deep dive. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's time to talk about the NFC West. We're going to hit all the divisions before training camp starts, and then we'll have a weekly training camp show as as camp begins. But the NFC West is, I would describe it this way, Michael as a division in transition because I think we've got a clear-cut favorite at the top and then we've got a kind of a dark horse right there that could make you know could really upset and I, let's let's just you know talk about it the way, it, the way we should talk about it I think the 49ers are the clear favorite I think the Seahawks are the second best team in that division I think they're capable of you know, beating 49ers for the division crowd. I think you go past that. Now you're looking at a Rams team that has been, you know, being retooled and you're looking at a Arizona Cardinal team that's in a full blown rebuild. And each of these teams are kind of fascinating in their own. And, you know, I think it's going to be great to talk about this division. Let's start with the 49ers because I think the 49ers are one of the class organizations in the national football league. Extremely well run top to bottom. I think John Lynch is a tremendous general manager. He's uh, one of the few players that's been able to make that transition from the playing field where he was a pro bowl safety for the Bucks and the Brown, excuse me, the Broncos, and then went right into the general manager role, and he's done, done it seamlessly. They manage the cap extremely well. They've got a great roster top to bottom. Um, I think that uh, you look at this offseason – you, you take Javon Hargraves away from the Eagles and you stick him on that defensive line, which is already that, – that front seven is dynamic in San Francisco. And you bring in a guy like Hargrave, that what a, what a big move that was. And I think this move that maybe nobody really is talking about, but having Sam Darnold as, in your quarterback row, I think is a key move for them because – you're talking about two guys ahead of him that are coming off major injuries, right? I mean, Brock Purdy did an outstanding job as Mr. Irrelevant to taking a team to a division championship and into the playoffs. He gets hurt against Philadelphia. Their season ends in Philadelphia, and the questions begin to be you know, out there. He has what's called a UCL, which is a ulnar ligament in his elbow repaired anytime a quarterback has you know elbow surgery it's it's dangerous uh everything i've heard from san francisco and the people i know out there is that he's a, ahead of schedule he's done a great job rehabbing um i saw he's getting married the other day which again you know that's another those are all factors you know in a, in a player's life but you know he's coming off ucl and then trey lance who's never really gotten an opportunity to you know do much on the field because he played behind Jimmy G and then he's been hurt. I think his his progress is really he's not where they want him to be right now. He had a nasty broken ankle that had some ligament tear damage to, to it too. So Sam Darnold gives that quarterback room some depth. Now Sam Darnold's not the answer, but Sam Darnold's a serviceable quarterback. And you know we talk about in the league, you got to have two. Well, in San Francisco, you better have three that have experience. Because they've got a great roster, and you don't want to throw your season out if you one of those two guys or two of those both of those guys can't come back off those injuries. I think I think first off, just talking about the quarterback position, you've summed it up there, and uh, I guess the thing that I'll add to it in terms of that whole NFC championship. For me, the ceiling around that franchise after that game against the Cowboys, like anybody could have sat and said. 
this team's going to win it all, this, this team's going to go all the way. The fact that somebody like Brock Purdy, a guy that was never meant to have a down tactically in, in San Francisco at one point, he wasn't, it wasn't going to happen for him because he had Jimmy Garoppolo and Trey Lance ahead of him. The fact that he came in, and Jeff, and he had such confidence, but more so such poise and quietness about himself, but such professionalism. Like we've seen, I've seen in my previous job last year, working with the Niners, just the respect that both sides of the ball had for him and continue to have for him. Cal, Cal used to, was coming out over the last week, you know, heaping praise on him. And at the time of recording, there was a lot of Niners fans. Let, let us know on YouTube. If you're watching this, folks, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, a, a lot of Niners fans watching this on YouTube or listening to the podcast will be wondering, you know, what exactly is going to go on? You, you have a situation where, you know, at the time of recording, you know, we, we expect Purdy to come in second week in August, around that there. You know, is that enough time to really put your claim forward to be the starter? I, f- I feel like they almost need to come out and talk about it more. I, I, I want to say, is that enough time? I mean, is that enough time for him to get back to the fitness that he needs to be in? You know, like this is a team that's fully docked, fully loaded on both sides of the ball. You're going to expect after D'Amico Ryans goes to Steve Wilkes, is going to try and keep that defense going. You, as you said, Javon Hargrave. Uh, I, I guess the minimum for them, I think I think we can both admit, we expect the Niners to win this division easily. Oh, I, I certainly do anyway. I'm sure you do. You know, they, they need to continue to have that elite defense. When you lose guys like Jimmy Ward, when you lose guys like Charles O'Wemenu, like you need to try and fill the gaps. And they've certainly done that. So... I, 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 I want to see Brock Purdy continue to have a chance. I, I want to see Brock Purdy be given the reins again. But I, I do, like, even going back to, was it week one or two last year, Jeff? I, I feel for Trey Lanceman. Like, he was the guy until he went down. And look, now, I do agree. Sam Darnold, did, did you see the bold prediction? Somebody said uh, the Niners over the Jets in the Super Bowl. Sam Darnold, he's the Niners. <laughs> that one is the bold one. I, I, you know, Sam Darnold, Sam Darnold, we're, you know, I don't think we're saying that he's the answer at quarterback, but certainly he's he's a guy that's played a lot of NFL games and he's got a better football team around him in a better system than he's ever been in. And so will would you expect him to be capable of coming in and getting you wins with this talent? Yes, in the system that they run. Now, is that the best thing for the for the 49ers? No, I don't think so. I think Brock Purdy's the best thing for the 49ers. And yeah. you mentioned about Brock Purdy and, and the season that he had, and you know, he goes from Mr. Irrelevant to Pro Bowler and all of that stuff. Go back and look at him at Iowa State. Now, he's playing in the Big 12 at a lower level Big 12 school. Iowa State is not going to get the same talent that, you know, Oklahoma is going to get. You know, that TCU is going to get that uh, even Texas Tech's going to get they're not going to get the talent Houston's going to get so what he did there was elevate all the players around him and he was a dynamic playmaker and all of the things that you talked about Michael his when you describe it as quietness which is when when everything is it's a high pressure moment the game slows down for him He's shown that. Now, again, that's a big jump to the NFL, but he played above and and he raised the talent level of his teammates at Iowa State. And I think that's something that's sometimes we don't, as talent evaluators, as as coaches and scouts and, and personnel people, sometimes you don't pay enough attention to that. And I think, you know, he didn't try to win the game by himself. He recognized what he had around him and stayed inside that system. And that's the key thing when you're when you're playing with the 49ers at quarterback. You know, Kyle Shanahan will dial up what you need. You've got a really good offensive line. They lost Mike McGlinchey, I get it, but they've done a great job of, you know, they still had Trent Williams, who's maybe the best tackle in football. And they've been willing, they're willing and able to find replacement guys that can come in and play a high level in that wide zone scheme. They've got the maybe the best all around tight end in football. They've got, you know, great running backs that are system running back, much like what Shanahan's dad had when he had the Denver 
you know, had Denver playing so well, you know, you, you look at some of the guys that they had that were Terrell Davis, a six round draft pick out of Georgia that nobody gave him a chance to make the football team. He makes the hall of fame because he fit in that system. And so I think that's what we're seeing with this San Francisco 49er team. Um, you know, you talk about weapons outside. If, if you get an eight-man front against them because you're saying, okay, we're going to stop the run. We're not going to let you run the ball on us. Great. Yeah, you can, you can stop. You can always be one plus in the run game. But Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, those are elite-level playmakers in the pass game. And so those guys can take over a game for you. You don't have to have, you know, that quarterback who can go back there and throw it 35 times, you know, out of a shotgun and in four wides and win the game. You have to have a guy that can take advantage of one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside and the play action game. And that's what Brock Purdy can do extremely well. I think you summed it up perfectly there. And I'd say people have asked some questions on Twitter. We'll, we'll do a separate podcast and we'll just roll through the teams. I feel like we need to, we need to talk about the Cardinals very quickly, Jeff. Like, well, I mean, wow. Well, I think, I think the Cardinals are, are an interesting study right now because, you know, they invested a great deal in Kyler Murray, you know, and to their first round draft pick and, you know, changed schematically for him, brought in a head coach who they felt could get along with him. They eventually, didn't get along. There was parting of ways there. It cost the head coach his job. Um, you know, they did, they were on the cusp for a little bit. You know, the, the tough thing for them was this was, this is a division at that time, you know, go back two or three years ago when the Cardinals were a pretty good football team. This is also a division that had a Rams team that was loaded and a 49ers team that was loaded. And the Seahawks are always a tough, tough team to play, especially when you go on the road. So this is a really tough division. They couldn't get over the hump. Now you lose DeAndre Hopkins. You lose Robbie Anderson. I don't worry. J.J. Watt retires. You lose Zach Allen. And now you're in a – and your quarterback gets hurt, and he's going to be gone for at least a half, half a year. And uh, the strength coach at the University of Hawaii put out a picture last week on Twitter. Kyler was over at in Honolulu working out, and he chose to come and work out at the gym at, at, in the training facility at the University of Hawaii. And he's still a long way away from being ready to play. He may not play this year at all. Now, they say maybe midseason, but, you know, when you're coming off of a, you know, surgical situation, it's, you know, you just never know. And so I think their best, for the, four, the best thing for the Cardinals, do not rush him back. Do not rush him back and get him hurt again. If he's the future and that's what you believe, then – Treat him like the future. Uh, I thought they got Paris Johnson Jr. in the in the draft, who I think will be a Pro Bowl ta tackle for him. Uh, BJ BJ Olari and you know, Garrett Williams and Michael Wilson. I thought they brought in some good young players. The problem is there's just not going to be enough of them. This is going to be a long year in the desert. A long year to say the least. You know, in 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 April, the owner Bidwell was accused of cheating. There's been various different things to you, kinds out. Um, where do you start here? Like genuinely, where do you start here? And I don't mean that in a negative way for Cardinals fans, but if you have the presumption that the Cardinals will most likely lose the majority of the games that they have without Kyler then how many games are they actually going to win this year? And I, I fully agree with you. You know, if, if the Cardinals believe that Kyler Murray is their man for the long term, 25 years of age, still relatively, in my opinion, Jeff, young man, serious talent, you, you build that team around him. But there's been a lot of change in Arizona. you got a different head coach from when Kyler came in, you got a different GM from when Kyler came in. A very, very different outlook. And I would wonder to myself, will Kyler Murray be the quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals week one of the 2024 season. I think that's the bigger discussion point here. I think the season's gone before it started. I think, yes, you bring in Paris Johnson Jr. Uh, at six in the draft. They had a hell of a draft. You know, you really start picking it up. You've got multiple picks in 2024. 
but I, I, I we we had this conversation. Uh, Mark Hogan and Jason Hayes, Pro Football Ireland, who Jeff actually both both were Cardinals fans, massively into the team. They had Darren Urban on from the Cardinals website, and and we had Tom Palisaro on. And, and Tom Palisaro was asked, "Is twenty twenty four the the summer of Kyler Murray?" Because for me now, I feel like you know the Cardinals have got so many picks already. They'll be picking in the top three next year. I just don't see how they get anywhere outside of three or four wins, maybe five if they're lucky. Yeah, I think that's that's probably realistic. And and uh, you know, especially I I just I think that the issue is more about rather than how many games they win, do they have the strength of character? Do they have the strength of you know? Is the ownership strong enough? Is the you know, are the play is the locker room strong enough to go through what has to happen when you rebuild a team like they're rebuilding their football team? They've got to know that it's a process. And the process is just trying to get better each week with who you have. Recognize that you're going to get, you're going to be, as you mentioned, Michael, they're going to be in great draft position again next year. What do you do with Buda Baker? He said he doesn't want to be there, you know, but. You know, they they can't seem to get a deal done for him. Um, I think you're going to want to look at all of those things. How do you get more salary cap room so that you can go out and add not only with draft choices but with key free agents that you may want next year? I think it's just uh, it's an unfortunate situation if you're a fan uh, and you expect to you know, see him go to the playoffs or any of that stuff. I think that's completely out of the realm of possibility this year. I think it, if you're a, if you're a Cardinal fan, what you want to see is these young guys come in and play well. You want to see what you drafted Paris Johnson for. You want to see the, the, you know, the makings of a pro bowl tackle. You, you know, you want to see BJ Olari be a threat off the edge. You want to see, those guys get better each week as pros. I, I think, you know, it's interesting to me, Kelvin Beecham, who's played an awful lot of football in the NFL and is a friend of mine, and he's he's going back for another season with the Cardinals, which really kind of surprised me because I thought he would be a guy that would be a, you know, in the rebuild, he'd be a guy that that they would get rid of. But he, I think they, but I think the reason they they kept kept him around is that Kelvin's a great character guy and he's a real pros pro and he can help mentor a guy like Paris Johnson. He can help teach him the ropes, teach him what it means to be a pro because even though you played at Ohio state and you played at a really high level, it's a step to the pro football ranks and to keep him focused and to keep him on task and to keep him recognizing that get out, get away from being tied into outcomes just try and get better each week. That's that's what your job is. And then let the personnel department and the head coach and the GM and the owner and everybody else figure out what the direction for this team is to get it competitive again. Because they may have, and this sounds absolute, this may shock people when I say this, but they may have a better chance to get better faster than the Rams do. Because they've got more more draft capital, they are they will they should have more free agent money available to them, so they'll have more money to go out and get quality guys. Um, now, you look at the you look at the Rams, and we might as well go ahead that way because this is the division we're talking about. You know, I'll just say one more thing on that. Yeah, just 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 while I have it. Yeah, you know, absolutely, their window was there right now. You're all if if you're the GM. You're already looking at April 2024. Trade Kyler, bring in Caleb Williams. Get that first, get that first two or three pick. Never mind the picks that you have come from the draft this year. Hell, go after Harrison as well, wide receiver. Um, and just just front load that. Deal with the implications financially and and move on from there. So yeah, Jeff, completely personally for me, I, I don't think it's a strong stretch to say that Kyler Murray doesn't play a down in the Arizona league again. Like well, genuinely at the minute. I, I truly think it's going to be interesting to see because none of the people that were a part of the decision to bring him in other than Bidwell are around in, in Arizona right now, right? And so 
we'll see. I, I think there's a lot of things that will go on in that building that will never happen on the practice field that are going to be determining factors in whether they stay with them or move down, move on down the road. It'll be in, it'll be intriguing to me, Mike, because there'll be, you know, if they want to get rid of him, then this sounds crazy, but if they want to get rid of him, they're going to say an awful lot about how great he is and what's, you know, how he's ahead of schedule in his rehab and all of that stuff. Because right now he's damaged goods. And he's damaged goods that as as dynamic and as as incredible as some of the plays he's made in his career are, if you think back to when he had an opportunity to go to the playoffs and he got in a playoff game and he looked absolutely out of his element. He looked completely like a deer in the headlights. And so, you know, when you're when you're talking about trading for that guy, and I'm and you're the Cardinals, and I'm somebody that actually wants him, but I'm going to tell you, well, I don't know if we can give you that much for him because you know, like I, I just remember that playoff. I mean, you know, so that's the give and take with this whole process, and that's one of the things that makes watching the front office move so much fun. This time last year, whispers started to come out about Matthew Stafford's shoulder. It was his shoulder, wasn't it? And we, we all know what really happened there. And like the, and his, his elbow, sorry, his elbow. My bad, folks. It's been a, been a long July. Baker Mayfield comes in, the quarterback merry-go-round happens, and yet the Rams still put up 50 against the Broncos on Christmas Day, which was a great crack to watch. Not. Um, I think for me, Jeff, forget about the, the cap space, forget about the severe lack of any activity really done for the Rams. It feels like anything will come down to how Stafford is this year and it feels like we're going to find out very quickly if Stafford is going to be around for much longer not just for the rounds Jeff but in the league because if his injury is not healed up and if he is not 100% you'd have to question really his performance long term ah, I, I, yeah, I think that's a fair assessment Mikey I, you know um, Matthew Stafford is not a young kid anymore right I mean He's been in this league for over 10 years, and he's taken a tremendous amount of pounding both in Detroit and with the Rams. Now, he was good enough to bring a Rams Super Bowl championship, and he'll always be re remembered for that and should be. Um, I think, you know, you look at the Rams season last year, and, you know, it was one of those ones where if anything could go wrong, it was going to go wrong. You lose Stafford, you lose Cooper Cup. I mean, you can't lose those two guys. And, think that you're not going to, you know, think that somehow you're going to fill the void. This offseason, Jalen Ramsey, gone, right? Bobby Wagner, gone. Leonard Floyd, gone. So they gutted that defense as well. And now it's going to be interesting to see. Obviously, Aaron Donald, in my opinion, is one of the two or three, you know, or in, a, in a handful of the top defensive players, maybe the best defensive player in the league. But he's lost an awful lot of good players around him. Um, Cooper Cup coming back is obviously going to help. Stafford having the year off and I think an opportunity to rehab. You, you can't, you can't, you can't understand unless you're, unless you're on the field and you see the hits these guys take, how those add up, and you know. He was behind some really bad offensive lines in Detroit for a long time, and he was trying to to win the game in the fourth quarter, you know. And and the defenses didn't care about the run because they knew they couldn't run, so they were just they were. I mean, it was awful what what he went through. Now, that's the price of playing quarterback in the National Football League, but it takes its toll. And if you know, it's going to be interesting to see how much he does have left if he has some left, which I think he does, they'll be okay offensively. Sean McVay's good enough football coach. They've got enough players there. Cooper Cuff's a dynamic enough guy. They'll be okay. The thing is that they had no ability to help themselves in free agency. They had little ability to help themselves in the draft because they had sold their soul for their Super Bowl, and now they're paying the price for it. So this is a team that 
I could see winning eight games. It's a team I could see winning four games. It's just going to be one of those kind of seasons. And, you know, they drafted their only draft pick in my mind that you can expect to start as a rookie is Greg Avila as an offensive lineman, which they need. But, you know, this is a team that's going to have to play way above its head and, you know, to have a punching chance. And if they get injuries again, I think it's going to be a real tough year in Los Angeles. I just hope we don't have the, you know, the, it's coming into like a yearly thing now where it's like get, you get to like week 15 and it's like, I mean, they might retire again. And you're like, lads, come on, it's been two or three years now. Like, what what's going to happen here? I guess you have that consistency in the head office and with the some of the coaching staff. McVeigh and his offensive calling is is great. I, I I think it would be difficult to see. Obviously, you've got Cooper Cup there and you've got Matthew Stafford there, but I think, Jeff, it would be difficult to see how that offense can be more productive than, than, than that, really. I just don't think that they're going to be able to put up enough points to beat a Niners team, to beat a Seahawks team. And when you've got, like, you know, you, you've mentioned about the lads that have left, I said of Aaron Donald, who in the hell have they got in that defense? Robert Rochelle, Russ Yeast, Rose Boone. Um, I mean, there's about five of us here I can name. Like I've, like I've been covering this league for seven or eight years, and like, like I had done look at some of these names. I, I feel Jeff that teams could put up points on them, genuinely. And I think you know, you look at the Cardinals, and you look at the Rams. And it could be a situation where Rams do struggle. That being said, as you've rightly said there now, they could find a way to get to, to, to eight or nine wins, especially when they're playing the Cardinals twice. Um, so in a weaker NFC, who knows what's going to happen? I guess that will be a perfect sideway into the final team that we should talk about, which is, drumroll, the Seattle Seahawks. Now, I am going to talk about the Seahawks, and I'm going to tell you straight up, without a shadow of a doubt, that I like this team. And I am a big Pete Carroll fan. Um, I think he is, his year last year, he should have been named Coach of the Year. And I think that, you know, I think this is one of the really good organizations in the league. Uh, their vice president of player development, Maurice Kelly's a big friend of ours in this show. And so I'm I'm bullish on on the Seahawks. Now I don't think they're better than the 49ers because, you know, you st- I'm still not. Even though Geno Smith came back and had that great year and was a pro bowler and all that, I just don't know if he's enough to win a Super Bowl with. But the thing that Geno Smith did better than anything else last year, Mike, singularly the best pro bowler, yes, Got him to nine wins, yes, but he gave us the quote of the year, maybe the quote of the decade in the NFL, when he said after the first game where they won, he said, people wrote me off, but I never wrote back. And I thought that was the greatest quote I've ever heard a player say. And I'm a big Geno Smith fan because of it. Not really, but I I, I, I did gain a lot of respect for Geno Smith. Um it's also a team that went out and tried to help itself in the offseason. You know, you go back and, you know, it's hard a lot of times because feelings get hurt when you get rid of a good player and a good player that's been part of a championship team. And that happened with the Seahawks and Bobby Wagner. But this isn't one of the reasons why I give Pete credit. They could have said, well, you know, they're not taking Bobby Wagner back because that's almost admitting you made a mistake to let him go the first time. And he doesn't care about any of that stuff. He doesn't, his ego is not involved like that. And so they bring Bobby Wagner back. They get Draymond Jones. You know, they bring in Evan Brown to help at center. Uh, Jaran Reed should help boost a pass rush that needs, needs help. And, you know, Devin Bush. If Devin Bush can get back to being the Devin Bush that he was early in his career, that's a, that's a plus. And Julian Love will help him at safety. So I think, I think they did a good job and, Jackson fans remember this name Jackson Smith and Jiba who is a dynamic wideout out of Ohio State their first round draft pick and Devin Weathers- Witherspoon their other first round draft pick those guys 
you know, again, thank you, Russell Wilson, because that Russell Wilson trade set them up to be able to draft two of the most dynamic players on the board in the draft, one on offense and one on defense at critical positions to upgrade because you're going to have to score points to beat the 49ers and you're going to have to be able to cover people to beat the 49ers. And Witherspoon can do that in spades. He's a great physical tough kid. And Jackson Smith and Jigba, I think when you pair him next to the guys that they've got now, that that could be three really dynamic receivers for Geno to throw to. You're, you're, t- you're talking about the perception or the the bonus that they got from that Broncos trade with hey, Russell Wilson. They got somebody else who was the Broncos, Dr- Draymond Jones. Draymond Jones coming in, which adds another level to that defense. Um, there's so many factors there. I would advise anyone to Google the Seahawks' death chart and just look at the offense. Kenneth Walker, DK, Tyler, as you said, Sniff and Jigba. No offense who could come into a better a better performance this season in Seattle. Um, look, Jeff, I if the Niners weren't in this division, I'd have them run away with this division. That's the reality of it. But the Niners are in this division. And it it just it makes me wonder, will the Seahawks be happy, terrified, or content only with their decision to to give Gino a, a, a multi year was it three years, 75, 76 million dollars? Big deal. Showing him a sign of faith. Gino had a great year last year, proved a lot of people wrong. It's like the question that we're having with the Giants at the minute. Will these guys, will these teams be able to repeat this after months of an offseason where multiple teams, multiple coaches, multiple scouts have been scouting these players for months? And I feel like it's such a big question mark. If Gino can turn it on, NFC Championship game. Well, I, you know what, Neil? I, I mean, you know what? That is such a great take. Because the reality of it is, this group of defensive coordinators that are in the NFL right now, a lot of those guys were not around when Geno was with the Jets. Right? Right. So they didn't know what Geno was. And there wasn't enough tape. He hadn't played in, in very many games or took very many snaps in his time as a backup in Seattle. And so it'll be interesting this year, now that they've had a full off season to break him down and see what he does well and see where he struggles and what, you know, what causes them problems and all that in his defense or in in Seahawks defense, I think he's got, and you mentioned it, I think he's got a really good supporting cast around it where when he was with the jets, he was a young quarterback trying to get a team over the hump and he was immature and it was, you know, he was just a young kid. Now he's a grown man. He's been through it. He's, you know, he, he's been humble. He understands the game better now. He understands how to prepare, all that kind of stuff. And with that supporting cast and the coaching that they have in Seattle, I think this is a team that don't think that as much as I, I love the 49ers, I think they'll win the division. But I don't think they're going to, you know, pound the Seahawks twice and go undefeated in the division. I just don't really believe that's going to happen. Yeah, I think the Seahawks have got really reached. Uh, I haven't got it on paper, but I remember they've got They've got a three or four week span. That's one of the hardest in the league in terms of their opponents. Next time I'll have it written down by don't Jeff. And um, t- I'll take the Niners winning the division. I'll take the Seahawks finish in second. I think the Seahawks can make a run in the off season if they keep everyone fit. Um, I, and it's, uh, I'll say Rams third. I think the Cardinals are way off, way off. Um, and yeah, that's mine. I'm presuming we're on the same page. I, I, I agree with your takes. I think like, um, I don't think that it would not be shocking to me to see the Seahawks and the 49ers split in their games. And uh, I think the Rams have the ability, if as long as Stafford's healthy, the Rams have the ability to rise up and beat anybody. Uh, I think everybody in the league, you know, because with the possible exception of the Rams will go you know, two and zero against the Cardinals. Uh, I I think the Cardinals are where they are, and that you know, again, there's nothing. Cardinal fans, I'm not down in your team. I'm just saying where you are right now is where you are, and you just gotta 
look at the process and recognize that you know you're going to have to rebuild that football team. You're you've lost. You're out of your Super Bowl window. The Rams are out of their Super Bowl window. I think now 49ers are well in theirs, and the Seahawks have a shot. So let's see how it goes. Let's end it in this week 16 of the NFL season. Who will be the Niners starting quarterback? Brock Purdy. Yeah, I, I think it has to be, and I think. I think if if Brock's not fully fit, third or fourth week of August, or say he's not fit by the seventh of September, I think you keep rolling with Brock. And if he if he needs a couple of weeks, he needs a couple of weeks, and and you give him the time he needs. He has earned, in my opinion, the spot to keep going there. I just hope that. I I think, and I don't want to go into the whole conversation. I think there's been lazy journalism in the off season from certain people saying, "Well, Trey Lance is done." Trey Lance will get an opportunity again, but I don't think his time in San Francisco should be over yet. And I think it would almost be lazy of someone to suggest, I'll oh, just get rid of him. So I think, watch this space, but I've, yeah, I, think it, I think it's Brock's team. But I, we're, look, we're, we're all the same pace, yeah, with, with this division. W- which one's up next? Then we're going to go to the NFC South. Have we done that one? I can't even remember. No, we haven't, have we? We haven't. Oh, the NFC South, yeah. Oh my God. That'll be a good division. I can't. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on the Bucks and, and different teams as well. Um, give us a aloha and say goodbye. Aloha and thank you for watching. Thanks for listening, folks. Uh, more content coming up throughout the weeks. Jeff, see you soon, man. All the best. All right, brother.